today is um, a more difficult subject to teach because at first sight it doesn't seem so relevant. On Sunday morning I talked about the kingdom of God. Yesterday morning I talked about the kingdom of Satan. But this morning I want to talk about the kingdom of Israel. And people say, well, what does that have to do with us? A very great deal, as we shall see at the end. You see, when Jesus came, his subject, which he preached for three solid years, was the kingdom. But he never told people what he meant by it. Have you ever noticed that? He never defined it. He described it, but he never defined it. He never said, this is what I mean when I say the kingdom of God. Now, why didn't he define it? Why didn't he tell them what he meant? The answer is very simple. They all knew. Because he was speaking to the Jews. And that was a word they understood perfectly well. The phrase, the kingdom of God, was something they were always talking about. Now, since we very rarely hear the phrase, the kingdom of God, outside church, we need to retrace the history of the people of Israel to understand what is meant by it. And so this morning, I'm just going to talk about the kingdom of Israel. And then tomorrow morning, I want to speak about the kingdom of Christ. And then on Friday morning, we'll pick up uh, Brian Hayes' theme from last evening and talk about the place of the Holy Spirit and the relationship between him and the kingdom. So there's a sense in which I was very tempted this morning to say, oh, let's skip the kingdom of Israel and get onto the more exciting bit quickly. Uh, but God said, no, you don't. And God said, I didn't skip that bit. I spent 1,400 years with the kingdom of Israel before I sent Jesus. So you better do the same. So I'm going to spend 1,400 minutes on the kingdom of Israel. There are two passages I want to read before we begin to talk. Um, I apologize for not reading the Bible yesterday morning. I meant to read Genesis chapter 3, but my introduction swept me on past the reading. So let's make sure we get something worth saying in this morning by reading the Bible straight away. The two passages are in Judges and 1 Samuel. Judges chapter 2 and verse 6 is the first passage that is going to be a key for what I want to say. I just feel the Lord has told me to put in one sentence the importance of studying the kingdom of Israel. And, and this is the sentence. If we don't do better than Israel, then the same thing will happen to us that happened to them. That's the importance of studying what happened to them. Just to expand on that for a moment, I find that many Christians think that because God has taken the kingdom from Israel and given it to the church, that the church cannot fail. And that's a dangerous complacency. And in fact, the New Testament says, Paul says in Romans 11, you Gentiles who now know the kingdom, don't you get conceited or arrogant or proud in your attitude to the Jews who lost it? Because the same God who cut them out of the kingdom could also cut you out. They only got the kingdom by faith and you only stand in the kingdom by faith. And you could lose it just as well. And in fact, the burden I got from the Lord earlier this morning was this, that large parts of the church in this country are going to lose the kingdom. And I'm sorry, but that's the truth. When the church calls itself the new Israel, and claims to inherit all the promises of the Old Testament, but ignores all the warnings of the Old Testament, that is not fair. Do you follow me? And if you go through the authorized version of the Bible and look at some of the headings that are sometimes included in those old versions, you'll find that everything nice that's promised to Israel in the Old Testament is a heading, God's love for his church. And everything nasty, it's headed, God's discipline of ancient Israel. <laughs> now listen, you can't have it both ways. If you want to claim the promises of the Old Testament, then you must take the warnings with them. God will treat the new Israel in exactly the same way as he treated the old Israel. And just as he cut most of the old Israel out of the kingdom, he could cut most of the church of Scotland out of the kingdom. There is no guarantee that that church building you attend is an eternal part of his kingdom. No guarantee whatever. And so we're going to study the history of Israel and ask the question, what went wrong? How did they lose the kingdom? I shall also deal very briefly with the question the disciples asked Jesus. The last thing they asked him before he went back home to Father was, when's Israel going to get it back? Because you see, just as Almighty God, King of heaven and earth, took the kingdom from Israel, he can also give it back to them. And he can take it from us. So that's the seriousness. And as the New Testament says, the things that were written about Israel were written for us, that we might learn from their mistakes. And the people who are not willing to learn from history are condemned to repeat the mistakes of history. So the kingdom of Israel is our subject. Now let's read the two passages. Joshua 2, verse 6. After Joshua, or Joshua, had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Yeshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Yeshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. It's the problem of second generation people of God. If you're in a new fellowship and still in the first flush of a new generation of believers, great. Your problems will come with the second generation. How to pass on to the next generation your living experience of the living God when they have not had that experience. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. Now those two names don't mean much to you, but Al means husband and Ashtaroth means wife. 
and it was a pretty foul sexual religion that was in the land of Canaan. And you actually went to church to have sex with one of the priests or the priestesses. You can imagine it was a pretty popular religion. They queued up. It was thought with sexual intercourse was an act of worship. It didn't matter who it was with. So you could have a different partner every Sunday morning in worship. Now that's what they were up against. So when we read these funny names, simply substitute in your own mind a sex-ridden society and you've got it. So it's not so very strange, even though the names are. And that's what they got into. And in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel. See whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Yeshua. And then the other passage, which to me is a key to understanding the history of the kingdom of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Yoel, and the name of his second was Abiyah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel came together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected as their king, but me. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they're doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maidservants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. So they said, no, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them, give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone is to go back to his town. There was a Benjamite or a Benjamite, a man of standing whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherat, son of Aphia of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. A man who became king and finished up in Satan's grip. Well, now let me start like this. God made the world, and he made people to control it. And he said to men, I will be your sovereign, and I will tell you what to do. You be my subjects, and you can have all of this for yourself. And we saw how man rebelled against that, and Satan, waiting in the wings, stepped into center stage and built his kingdom out of the rebellious hearts of men. So from God's point of view, he had to look at planet Earth and see a rival kingdom, which he had allowed to happen. It wasn't that he was helpless, he allowed it to happen. But he looked at a world that he had made very good, and he saw it filled with war, disease, death, and from God's point of view, he must have wondered what to do about it. What would you do in his position? Well, one of the things he could do would be to wipe it all out and start again. He was king. He had the power to do it. And he did do that once. And the story of Noah and his flood is the result. And he decided to wash the whole thing out and start again. But he decided to keep just one family as the nucleus. And within hours of getting out of the ark, that family was in disgrace. The father of it was drunk and exposed himself the sons were taking advantage of their father's weakness. So it's a sad story, and God decided not to try that way ever again, not as long as the earth remained. 
and the rest of the bible is the story of god's plan b and the other way he chose to restore his kingdom on earth now let me say straight away that far too many christians think that the only future of the kingdom lies in heaven and that the church's job is to rescue as many individuals out of earth as we can and deliver them to heaven safely almost as if the earth is the titanic going down and our job is to get a few individuals into the lifeboat and deliver them to heaven safely listen the bible says the future of the kingdom includes the earth it's not just getting a few more to heaven god's objective is the re-establishment of his kingdom on earth and he's told us to pray every day that his kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven so listen it's far too narrow a view of our task as the church to rescue a few individuals and deliver them safely to heaven we're to be concerned with the re-establishment of the kingdom of god on earth why should god give up on what he's made he is determined to have earth as well as heaven yet for every sermon i've heard on heaven for every 30 sermons i've heard on heaven i've not heard one on the new earth have you how many of you have ever heard a whole sermon on the new earth and that's as important to god as the new heaven so listen it's a far too simplified gospel to say god wants to save you and get you to heaven and save you from hell listen god wants to re-establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven that's why he sent jesus to earth and so god was ne never again after noah's day going to wipe it all out from then on he resolved to re-establish his kingdom on earth another way what was that way it was to start with anyone who was willing and create a people who would be a model of his kingdom for everybody else to see not to wipe them all out nor to try and force everybody into his kingdom which he could have done he decided to start with anyone who would respond and to create a both a model for people to see what his kingdom was like and a base of operations from which he could reach the rest of the nations now philosophers call this the scandal of particularity better explain that it's another long word like delicatessen so i better explain it to you the scandal of particularity is this why should god just start with some people instead of the others why should he start with the jews instead of the chinese why should he have a particular people a chosen people and people are offended by that now we had three we have three children sorry it's the best day of one of them today but we have three children and i used to give them sweets and there were two ways in which i could give them sweets one was to give them each a bar of chocolate that was the way of peace um the other way was to give one of them a bag of sweets and say share that with your brother and sister um the first way didn't test anything the second way tested their relationships and very quickly revealed whether they were in love that day or not if god gives something to some to share with the others that's always a test of relationships god did not choose to give his kingdom to the chinese and the indians and the africans separately that would not create a family he decided to give his kingdom to a few people the jews and say now share that with the others that was his way but it tests relationships in just the same way in a church where some receive gifts of the spirit that tests the relationship within the church people say the gifts of the spirit divide they do nothing of the kind they just reveal the divisions that already exist if a church is not already in a relationship of love what happens if somebody receives a special gift well because one rejoices the rest all weep but according to the new testament where relationships are right if one rejoices all rejoice i remember a lady coming to me in our church and saying i really am bitter and resentful she said and i'll tell you what it's about she said these young people they didn't keep the church going through all the years that we had a struggle they they march into the church and they get blessed in the spirit and they're speaking in tongues in weeks or days and i've been praying for years for that and I've never had it she, said, she was very angry and she was honest enough to say i'm bitter and i said but you did receive that gift and she said when i said when they did she said what do you mean i said well they're part of your body and if they received a gift that means you did so did you thank god that when they got that gift you, you got it did you say thank you and she said no i said well you go home and get on your knees and say lord thank you for giving me that gift because they're part of me we're one body we're not separate individuals so she went home and she said thank you to god only she wasn't speaking in english when she said it you see god's way is to create family therefore he doesn't give us each separately something so that we can go off into a corner and rejoice he gives it to someone and says share it with the others i rang up a friend in south africa about a year ago i hadn't seen him for 30 years we were at college together in cambridge he was in the next study to mine and one day he came in and he gave me a pair of hand knitted socks i can feel them now lovely and warm i said thank you very much donald but why are you giving me this he said because it's my birthday i said oh i'm sorry if i'd known how to got you something he said no no he said my mother brought us up she was a widow and he said she brought us up always to give things away on our birthday not to receive but to give so she sent me a dozen pair of socks to give away to other students on my birthday and i rang him up <laughs> in South Africa a year ago and I said Donald this is David David Paulson I said is your mother still alive she said yes he said yes I said will you thank her for the socks he said fancy you remembering I couldn't forget we so think that gifts are for us and the gods ways to give me something you know to give me a gift of healing so that I can be a great healer to give me a gift of evangelism so I can be a great evangelist no the only gifts he gives you are to give away to someone else so he looked around the world at God and said who can I give my kingdom to to give it away to all the others that was his method and he found an old man of 80 years of age living in a, a lovely home with central heating and running water in the bedrooms and he said would you be willing to live in a tent for the rest of your life the man's name was abraham i'm not fooling you about the central heating and running water in the bedrooms archaeology in era of the colonies has revealed that it was a most sophisticated town with all mod cars 
and it had central heating in the homes and running water in the bedrooms. I showed my wife a picture of a fireplace that had been excavated in the area of the colonies. And do you remember? And I said, how do you like that fireplace? She said, it's a little old fashioned, but I could live with it. I said, it's 4,000 years old. And to an old man of 80 living in a comfortable home, God said, would you do what I tell you? Would you leave this comfortable home? Would you live in a tent for the rest of your life? And I won't tell you where you're going to live. You just have to set off. Trust me. And the dear old man said, yes. And though the whole human race were enemies of God, from that day, God had one friend. And that's perhaps the loveliest title that was ever given to anyone in the Bible, a friend of God. Would God give you that title? Well, who is a friend of God? A friend of God is someone who begins by doing what God tells him, by being a subject of the king. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Abraham was perfect. He lied about his wife to save his own skin. And that was the result of having gone rather further than God told him to. God told him to go to Canaan, so he went to Egypt. If you look on the map, that's much further. Have you ever noticed how often we go much further than God tells us? You know, once we got onto something, that's it. Oh boy, we're off. You can't hold us if we go to extremes. God says, I didn't tell you to go that far. <laughs> oh, but Lord, that was the direction you gave us, and I was off. <laughs> and then there was the time that Abraham wanted to hurry God's business up for him and, and decided to produce a son for himself, his way. And he produced Ishmael, the father of the Arabs. And I just don't know that Abraham ever realized what trouble he would cause in the 20th century by fathering Ishmael. So I'm not going to tell you he was perfect, but he was a subject. And when God said, you go and sacrifice Isaac, he went. That was the beginning of the re-establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. God had one friend who would do what he told him. And that's why you, if you also have the faith to be obedient to God and do what he tells you, are sons of Abraham. You're related to that 80-year-old man. Does that get you excited or not? I hope it does. It relates you too to the Jews. Let's go quickly through. I want to take you on a package tour through the whole Old Testament this morning. That's going to take us a little time that I've been told I must finish by half past 12. So let's put spikes on our shoes and get going. The person became a family. The family became a tribe. The tribe became a people. And the people became slaves in Egypt. And God allowed all that to happen. And it must have looked to those descendants of Abraham as if God's plan was really coming unstuck. Where was the kingdom? Where was the king? Where was the demonstration of God's sovereignty? But God knew what he was doing. And once they'd become a people, even though they were slaves, God was able to say, now I can establish my kingdom. I will demonstrate my sovereignty by getting them out of there, and I'll show them my mighty hand in doing so. And then I'll tell them what it will mean to be my subjects, and I'll give them a land, a place they can call their own, where they can dwell in peace and prosperity, and the whole world will see what a blessing it is to live in my kingdom. That was God's plan. I heard a lovely story not long ago about a, a liberal preacher. Do you know what I mean by a liberal preacher? I don't mean one who preaches all the time. I'm liberal. Um, I mean someone who reads his Bible with a pair of scissors in his hand, and everything supernatural gets snipped out. And this liberal preacher was preaching on the exodus from Egypt. And, and he said, um, he said there wasn't really a miracle at that time. He said, because in fact, the Red Sea at that time and at that place is only about 18 inches deep and they would only need to wade across. So we mustn't think it was a miracle. And a lady in the audience shouted, hallelujah. And he said, why did you shout hallelujah? She said, the great miracle. He said, what great miracle? She said, drowning the Egyptian army in 18 inches of water. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you look at it. God's mighty arm was laid bare. And God was saying, now I'll show you who's king. It's not Pharaoh. And God, it seemed as if he pulled every miracle out of the bag he could. Frogs, blood, boils, a lot. And what he was saying was, I'll show you my sovereignty first in releasing you. And then I'll tell you how to live in righteousness as my subjects. And those are the two themes of the kingdom of God, release and righteousness. The trouble is everybody wants release and nobody wants righteousness. It's the same problem I mentioned two mornings ago. That people want God to be their sovereign, but they are not so keen to be his subjects. And the whole problem of Israel can be summed up in just that one sentence. They constantly wanted God to act sovereignly to release them. But they were not willing to behave as his subjects in righteousness. That's the whole sad tale. But kingdom means sovereignty and subject. Kingdom means release and righteousness. And I believe that the note that David Black sounded on Sunday night will be sounded, was it Sunday night? Yes. Will be sounded increasingly, the note of righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness. It's not just release. Lord, release me from my rheumatism. Lord, release me from my circumstances. Lord, release me from the overdraft of the bank. Lord, release me from my unemployment. Lord, release me. God must hear cry after cry of his people and he has compassion. But he must wonder how many of them want to say, Lord, release me from my sin into righteousness. I believe that's a note that he once sounded this week. Are you as anxious to be released from your bad habits as your physical sickness? That's what God is asking. Yes, he wants to release you from both. But he's wondering how many want to be his subjects once he's released them. But release comes first in kingdom activity. So God said to the Jews in Egypt, I'm going to release you. I've heard your cries. You want to release. You want to be out of that slave. You want to be out of those depressing circumstances. Then I have heard. And he said, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said, who's king? I'm king of Egypt. They don't go. And God said, I'm king of Egypt. They do. I'm not using the exact words. I'm summarizing history. But who was king of Egypt? God was. And he 
could do what he liked with old Pharaoh, even harden his heart. So God got them out and he brought them to Sinai and he said, now, now I'll spell out the other side of the kingdom. I've released you. You're on your way to a land flowing with milk and honey. I can get you there in less than a fortnight. It's only 11 days from here to the land I've prepared for you. 11 days. They could have been into God's blessing in less than a fortnight. So what went wrong that kept them 40 years in the desert? Nothing wrong with the sovereignty of the kingdom. They were not subject. Do you know this is God's eternal problem in re-establishing his kingdom on earth? He can find plenty of people who want his release. He can't find many who want his righteousness. So what was God requiring of them? I can sum up the Ten Commandments in one word, respect. Respect is the very essence of being a subject of the kingdom. Respect for God, respect for his name, respect for his day, respect for parents, respect for life, respect for property, respect for marriage, respect for reputation. If you can sum up the one thing God was after in response from them to being released, it was respect. That may be a strange thing to say to you. Some of you may never have looked at it like that before. But you know, the one thing that has been destroyed in our society today is respect. Would you agree? It is all those respects that I've just mentioned. We could not be putting one baby every six minutes in the gas oven if we respected life. We couldn't be doing it. We couldn't be breaking up two marriages out of every three if we respected marriage. Do you know if shoplifting stopped tomorrow, the cost of living would go down between 2 and 3% overnight. But every shop you go into now, you'll see TV cameras, warnings, security, chains around everything in the shop. Right here, in Aviemore, you'll see it. Why? Because respect for property is gone. Now that's what God asked for. He said, I've released you, now respect me and respect each other. And society is built on respect. When respect is destroyed, it goes. Somebody here I was discussing a year ago, the program Not the Nine O'Clock News, one of the leading comedians there, now they're funny, they've got a gift of humor, but one of the leading comedians, actually said that the aim of that program was to destroy respect. He said, we intend to leave nothing sacred. Nothing sacred, which means nothing that people respect. So they systematically set about destroying respect for leadership, political leaders, respect for religion. They just set about destroying it. And then they finally tackled moral issues with that program, Sin on Saturday, and they decided to destroy all respect for virtue. And after two programs, they were taken off. Satan is not very clever. He always overreaches himself. But I'm, I'm diverting from my theme. God then brought them into the promised land, eventually, after 40 years, when they didn't respect him. But he brought them in. And the rest of their history can be divided into three chapters, and we need to learn from all three chapters. I would say chapter one, before they had kings, chapter two, when they had kings, and chapter three, when they had no kings. Does that keep it simple for you? I, I was saying to someone last night, I think, to you, brother, that uh, I constantly remember the word kiss when I'm talking. Keep it simple, stupid. And I'm trying to... K-I-S-S, -S. I'm, I'm trying to do that. So let's try and keep it simple. I'm not calling you stupid, I'm speaking myself from a sinner. Uh, but let's keep it very simple. Chapter one, before they had kings. That was the ideal form of government. We tend to think of Israel's high point as the period under their kings, and particularly under King David. But in fact, God's pattern of government for them was not to have their own king. And the church falls into the same mistakes as Israel again and again. We want centralized government. Now let me tell you what God's intention was, how he intended to rule his people. He intended to plant them all over the land in groups, tribes, clans, and to give each of the groups their own elders. And that's all. There was to be no central governing body, no central government. If they got into trouble and needed serious help, he would raise up what was called a judge, a charismatic leader with gifts to get them out of that mess. But he was to get them out of the trouble. He was not to become a central ruler. When Gideon got them out of trouble with the Midianites, they came to Gideon and said, Gideon, you're a great guy. Will you cover us? Will you rule over us? Will you start a dynasty? Will you be king? And Gideon knew God well. And he said, I will not be your king. I will not rule over you. You've got a king, the Lord. The substitution of human leadership for the divine kingship is a mistake that the church makes again and again. We are to have no king but Jesus. He is to rule the church. He is the only head. There are no heads in the church but Jesus. The word head is never applied to any church leader. We are to have elders, local elders. And from time to time, God will raise up a translocal charismatic leader for a particular purpose. But he is not to become a permanent ruler. Now, I'm saying things here that are pretty relevant, I think, to many of the questions being discussed today. On Thursday afternoon, I'm quite sure some of the leaders will be tackling me on this. But you see, in the days of the judges, as long as there were elders around who had personally experienced God's power, that worked all right. It was fine. But it went wrong very quickly when a new generation of elders and people arose who did not have personal experience of the sovereignty of God in their lives. And therefore they said, why be subject to him? Now, I just share that with you. If you feel the next generation is not willing to be subject, then go to the root of it. 
is it that they have not experienced the sovereignty? Do, do you hear what I'm saying? I told you about that nurse in the hospital, that Jamaican nurse who was uh, saying to me that she was forced to go three times a Sunday and she was rebelling against it all because she didn't understand what it was all about. What was happening was her parents were trying to make her subject of the kingdom before she'd experienced the sovereignty of the Lord in her life. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And sometimes you've got to let your kids go and get into a mess that they may experience the release and the sovereignty of God. If you try and make them subjects before they've experienced the sovereignty, you will produce a legalism. You'll produce something that is unhealthy. And I don't know whether to feel more sorry about children who are rebelling against Christian homes and getting into a mess, or children who've taken the line of least resistance and go dutifully long to church with their parents, but have no personal experience of God as king. I don't know which I pity most. But you see, somehow the next generation has to learn the sovereignty of God, as well as being subject. Well now, what went wrong in the days of the judges? Because they just got into one mess after another. It says at the end of the book of Judges, there was no king in Israel in those days. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now what was wrong? The Israelites says what is wrong is that we have no king. God says what is wrong is that you each do what is right in your own eyes. Now can you see the different points of view? They said, God, we haven't enough sovereignty around. God, we want a king. And God says, no, that's not the problem. I want subjects. And because of the temptations, particularly in the sexual area, that were all around the next generation, I'm afraid they gave way to it. And so here was a people living who were not subjects of the king. And God in his sovereignty rescued them again and again and showed that he could do it. But they blamed him for his bad government. They never thought of blaming themselves. Isn't that true? We get ourselves into a mess and we say, God, why did you let this happen? It's not his fault. It's often because we were not subject to him. It wasn't his sovereignty that was to blame. Well, now that was chapter one of the history of Israel. So finally they came to Samuel and said, right, Samuel, things have got to change. We need a different form of government. Now listen. I want to say this very carefully, but the answer to our situation is not in a different form of church government. It is in a people willing to be subject. I'm sorry, but I'm saying that out of the depths of my heart. There are those who say, well, all I need is a human king who will tell me what to do. That's not the answer. That doesn't produce what God wants. It can produce a subject subject. But what God wants are those who say, I want to do what the king of heaven tells me. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't room for leadership in the church. I'll come back to that on Friday or Thursday. But nevertheless, I want to start here. When the Israelites said, you see, God, we don't have the right form of government. We need a king. When the church copies governments of the world, it's going down the wrong track. The kingdom has a very different form of government to the governments of the world. Very, very different. And when we look at Jesus' teaching, we'll see what kind of government he wants. But the answer doesn't lie in changed human structures of government. It lies in people's hearts. Do you notice that the same book of Judges that says every man did what was right in his own eyes also says they all did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And that was the real problem, that people said, well, it's all right for me to do this, but in God's sight, it was all wrong for them to do that. And they were able to justify it. And you'd be amazed, if you do any counseling, you'd be amazed what Christians can persuade themselves is all right for Christians to do. And it's perfectly right in their own eyes, but in God's sight, it's wrong. That's the root of the problem. And we keep crying out for more sovereignty, more control, more government, more this, more that, more the other when really the problem is my heart does not want to be subject to God. So they clamored for a human king, and God said, all right, Samuel, give it to them. Let them have it. And I think he meant that in more ways than one. And they only had three kings as a united nation. They only had three kings. The first turned out absolutely the wrong man. He looked all right, but his heart was not right. He was not a subject of heaven. And a king has got to be a subject of heaven. When Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in Westminster Abbey, my father was sitting there at the time, and uh, he had the privilege of being in the abbey for it. And uh, when she was crowned, the thing that struck him most, that he talked about most afterwards, was when she was handed a Bible, I believe handed the Bible by the moderator of the Church of Scotland, and she was told, this is the royal law, meaning this is the law for you. This is the law to which you are to be subject. And an earthly king is no use unless they are subjects of the King of Kings. I've got a picture at home. It's one that you may have seen. It's called King of Kings. And it's an incredible old painting that went into the Royal Academy when it was painted. Uh, it is the personal portrait of 159 rulers of earth. Have you ever seen it? And in the middle is Christ in the most luminous white robe. No artist has ever been able to get such a luminous robe again. Um, he's there in a white robe. Behind him is the devil who is cowering away. And in front of Jesus, you can recognize 159 kings, queens, and rulers. There's Napoleon folding his arms and looking at Jesus coldly from a distance. There's Edward the Confessor putting his crown down on the ground in front of Jesus. And you can see the attitude of every sovereign to the King of Kings in the picture. It's a marvel. How many of you have seen the picture? Nobody else has ever seen it. Famous picture. And you look at it, it just says everything. Jesus in his majesty, confronting all the kings and queens of England, Scotland, all over the place. You've seen it. Yes. That's my wife. She's just... <laughs> that's just a proof that it, it's, it's real. You look at the kings of Israel and say, how many of them were subjects of the King of Kings? And the answer is, hardly one of them. Saul certainly wasn't. He finished up in a spiritist medium's presence, playing around with occultism. 
But you may say, but what about King David, a man after God's own heart? Yes, there is a sense in which the nearest Israel got to the kingdom of heaven on earth was under King David, and they never forgot that. Under his leadership, they came to a time of peace and prosperity that they'd never known before, and to this day, the Jews long for that time to come back. When the Jew asks, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel, what he's meaning is, will you get us back to where David got us? But I want to tell you that even King David never got fully released from the kingdom of Satan. Did you know that? Satan got hold of David. How? Anybody know? Through a woman, through Bathsheba, I'm hearing from all over the place, but I'm sorry, that's the wrong answer. There is no mention of Satan whatever in that whole episode. Isn't that amazing? Do you remember when I told you not to blame Satan for too much? Listen, David saw Bathsheba and broke five of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. I'll leave you to think of which they were. He didn't just commit adultery. He stole, he killed, he bore false witness. In fact, in one fell swoop, he just drove a coach and horses through the Ten Commandments. He doesn't mention Satan once in that whole episode. That was David's flesh that did all that. It was his own weakness. Satan didn't bother him at that time. He did it all on his own. Got himself in a right old mess. But that's not what I'm referring to. Only once during David's life is Satan mentioned. Did you know that? Satan came up to King David and said, David, how about a census? How about counting the kingdom you've got? That was when Satan got a hold of David. And it was virtually the end of his career. What was wrong with it? I'll tell you what was wrong. You do a census for one or two reasons. You might do it out of pride to see how many people you've got. And it's wrong to count after your battles. You should count before your battle, but not afterwards. But it wasn't just pride. A census would lead to taxation and conscription. And you know what the Lord said to David when he was going to make the census? The Lord said clearly to David, David, are they not all your willing subjects? Why introduce force? They all love you. They will do what you tell them. They're your willing subjects. Why start bringing the heavy hand of central government in? But I'm afraid the damage was done. And under King Solomon, all the things that Samuel had warned of came true. And the centralized government demanded more money, demanded more conscripted labor, took the free sons and daughters of Israel and made them slaves of the system. And if you think Solomon's reign was glory, well, the Queen of Sheba thought so. But if you'd asked the average Israelite, he hated it. And as soon as Solomon died, civil war broke the kingdom up. Listen, what I'm saying is this. The basic problem was not the lack of sovereignty. It was the lack of subjects. Do you hear me on this? They said, what we need is a king. But when your king is still able to be manipulated by Satan, you're no better off. And from then on, you read the book of Kings and you find there are more bad kings than good kings. In fact, in the northern part of the kingdom, they didn't have one good king, just one bad one after another who did evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the people at the top of the nation do evil in the sight of the Lord, what hope is there for a nation? The rest of the people just followed. Until the day came when Elijah pinpointed the problem. And Elijah gathered the nation of Israel on the Mount of Carmel and he said, I will tell you what the root problem is. And as, as I say this, I sense God is speaking to us in this room very forcefully. Elijah said, how long will you go on halting with two opinions? Now, did you hear what I said there? He did not say, how long do you halt between them? I'm going to stand up just for a minute to show you something. You see, I get the impression from my Sunday school days in preaching I've heard on this, that here was the nation of Israel standing here thinking, shall we go that way? Shall we go that way? Shall we worship God or worship Baal? How long do you halt? Stand still, wondering which way to go. That's not what Elijah said. Halt is not to stand still in the Bible. It is to walk lame. It's an old-fashioned word to us. But halting is that. That's halting. Do you understand what I mean now? And Elijah was saying, you're walking with one foot in the gutter and the other on the pavement. You're walking with one foot in Baal and the other in Yahweh. How long are you going to limp along in two kingdoms? Now, do you hear me? That is the basic thing that holds back the re-establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. It is not that the people of Israel didn't want to acknowledge Yahweh, their own God, but they were playing about with other kingdoms also. Do you understand me now? They were halting between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, not standing in the middle wondering which to go with, but trying to walk in both. And the basic reason why the people of Israel failed to re-establish the kingdom of God on earth was that they wanted a foot in both kingdoms. They wanted a foot in the world and another foot in heaven. And the basic problem in evangelism today is not how to get the church into the world, but how to get the world out of the church. That's the basic problem. God is looking for people who will stop halting in two kingdoms, who will stop going both ways. And Elijah, after that, by the way, I must, must hurry. Uh, I must tell you about a friend of mine. Um, he, he died in his 90s on Christmas Day three years ago, but he lived in Palestine for 40 years. And, and this man, Leonard Pearson, some of you may have heard of him, he spent three days on his hands and knees in the great hollow on the slopes of Mount Carmel, which is the only place that um, Elijah's challenge could have been made because there is a spring there that never runs dry, way up the mountain, and this great natural arena. And he spent three days on his hands and knees going backwards and forwards, looking to see if he could find any trace of Elijah's altar after 3,000 years nearly. What faith. And all he found was a little lump of rock the size of a hen's egg that had stuck to one side of it a sheet of what looked like green glass. But it was incredibly hard. He couldn't scratch the surface of this green glass. Couldn't even scratch it with his wife's diamond ring. But he took this piece of stone to the geology department of the Hadassah University in Jerusalem, and he said to the professor of geology, what's this lump of stone? And the professor said, well, you didn't find that in Israel, but I'll certainly examine it. And find it. He said, I did, but I'm not telling you where. 
But what is it? And he went back in three days. The professor said, do you mind if I take a slice of it off and analyze it? He said, no. And he went back in three days and the professor said, you're going to be terribly disappointed. It's just a lump of limestone. It's just ordinary stone. But he said, this green stuff on the side, he said, it's been subject to the most indescribable heat. He said, I can't think what sort of heat other than atomic radiation or something would, would metamorphose the, the stone like that. And Leonard knew he'd got a piece of Elijah's art. <laughs> he brought that same piece of rock to the British Museum, and I've seen the British Museum's report on it. Their report was just the same. This is an ordinary piece of stone that has completely changed its structure due to the most indescribable heat touching it. I tell you, I, I could worship relics. <laughs> and I, I took one party out to Israel, and I had them on their hands and knees in the same spot. I said, find me a piece of that <laughs> And you know, they, they were all looking, and suddenly I saw them all stand up and walk towards me, and they came to me and said, we're not going to go on looking anymore. I said, why not? They said, we realize what you'd do with it if you had it. You'd worship it, so we're not going to. And they saved me from becoming an idol worship. But you know, when I, held, when I held that piece of stone in my hand and realized the fire of God had been on that, a shiver went up my spine. And Elijah said, I challenge you, which God is king? Now they have discovered through archaeology that Baal worship used to call on God to send fire. But they discovered an altar in Israel with an underground tunnel. And the priest would creep along with a box of matches. And Elijah said, build it out in the open where we can all see you know, no hocus pocus, build it right there and I'll build mine. And Elijah had the courage and the faith to laugh at them before he proved his own. I marvel at it. He said, shout a bit louder, maybe your God's on holiday, maybe he's sitting on the toilet, maybe... Elijah said that. I know in your polite English versions it doesn't say that. It says he's turned aside, but that means one thing in the Middle East. And he actually, he actually dared to make jokes about Baal. And then at three o'clock in the afternoon he said, now God, show them, show them. And then he ran for his life because of a woman, Jezebel. He finished up in the wilderness, saying an incredible thing to God, which I'm afraid I can't help laughing at. He said, God, I'm the only subject you've got left. And he'd just run away. <laughs> Does that strike you as funny? You know, I'm your only true subject, and <laughs> he'd just been running for his life. Like Simon Peter said, the others may run, but I'm, I'm your true subject, Lord. And the Lord said, Peter, before tonight's over, you'll be running too. Oh, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to say, God, I'm the only true subject around here. Don't you ever get into that proud habit. I'm the only keen member in our church. I'm the only true subject of God in Scotland. Listen, God very kindly didn't say, Elijah, you're on the run, so you're not my true subject. What he did say, Elijah, you got your sons wrong. I've got 7,000. I heard an Arab preacher in Jerusalem begin his sermon like this. Why did Elijah have a nervous breakdown? Because he didn't have any fellowship with the 7,000. That's quite a sermon, an introduction. But anyway, have you noticed that God did not say, there are 7,000 who've remained true to me? He didn't say that. He said, I have reserved 7,000. It was God's sovereignty that had done. God says, I've kept 7,000 for myself. And that's to be the story of the rest of Israel's history, that God has always kept a remnant, even to this day. There has never been a single period in the last 3,000 years when there haven't been some Jews who were true subjects of the kingdom of heaven. Did you know? It's an amazing thing. The church didn't replace the Jews. The Gentiles were grafted in among the branches that remained. There have always been Jews who were true to the king. There have, for the last 2,000 years, always been a remnant of Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Did you know that? God says, I've kept 7,000. Well, I must hurry on. Ultimately, they became such bad subjects of the king that the prophets were sent to tell them, out of this land, out of God's sight, go back to slavery. And they went back to Babylon. And you might have said, well, God, that was a failure, wasn't it? You didn't get your kingdom established, did you, through those people? You better try somebody else. I just marvel at a God who says, no, I'm going to try again with them. I'll bring them back and we'll start again. If God wiped his hands of people the first time they failed him, I wouldn't be preaching to you now. What a king to have who says, I don't let go that easily. In fact, you know, the reason why there is such a nation as Israel on the map today is very simple. God says, I hate a divorce. He hates breaking faith once he's made a promise. Hates it. So God brought them back, but he never gave them a king again. They had a temple again, but not a palace. They had priests again, but no kings. And so what many people don't realize is that for most of their history, the children of Israel did not have kings. I know we read the Bible in the book of Kings and think they must have had king after king after king. But in fact, it was a very, very tiny period when they had kings. The kingdom was really to be established in such a way that the king was in heaven, not on earth. And God had a beautiful one up his sleeve. I, I find myself chuckling when I think of this. God said, how can I bring them back to a view of the kingdom on earth where the king is in heaven? Because that's his ideal. And this is what he thought up. I'll give them a son of David and I'll send him to earth and then I'll bring him back to heaven to reign. Isn't that simple? He took their hopes and somehow transformed them. They just wanted a return to the time of David with an earthly king, with the peace and prosperity of that time. And God said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll give you a son of David, but he'll bring the kingdom back here. He'll reign from heaven and he'll have a people on earth whose king is in heaven. That is God's objective. That's the model on earth that he's looking for in the church too, to have a people with no visible king, with no centralized government, but a people who are so subject to the king of heaven that they operate together in harmony. What sort of unity would most impress Scotland? Every denomination getting into one denomination and having one huge headquarters in Edinburgh? Would that impress them? No, I'll tell you what would impress them, to find in every corner of Scotland 
people thinking the same way, doing the same thing, enjoying the same joy, enjoying the same peace. And people scratch their heads and say, how come you go to John O'Groats and you find the same thing? How come you go to Sky and you find the same thing happening there? And they don't have any centralized government and they don't have anybody telling them what to do. Who's, who's organizing it? Who's controlling it? Well, these are subjects of the King of Heaven. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? We still think the answer is structural government and all coming under the same guy and all coming under the same denomination. That's not God's way. God's way is to have people living all over the place with their own elders, but obeying the King of Heaven and doing what is right in his eyes. Then you'll see a unity among God's people right the way through, and it'll work. We crave for earthly government to put us right, and God's ways is subject to the King. So we close the story of the Kingdom of Israel by saying, was it a failure or was it a success? Well, for most of the Israelites, it was a failure. They were not subjects of the king. They had experienced his sovereignty again and again and again. But God did not experience their subjection. They were not subject to him. So, was it a failure? No. There was always, all the way through, a remnant of true Jews who were subjects of the kingdom. You know, when Jesus was born, there are a couple mentioned there, Simeon and Anna. Dear old woman. Dear old man. And they were subjects of the kingdom. They were looking for the kingdom. Their heart's desire was to see God's king come. Dear old Simeon was able to say, Lord, let your servant go in peace. Now, I don't mind dying now. And all he'd seen was a baby. But he was looking. So there was always a remnant. And that remnant clung to two promises of God. One was that he would send them a king of his choosing. A king who would establish his rule on the earth, not just for Israel, but for all the nations. So there was to be a national restoration of the kingdom. But there was also to be an international the prophet Isaiah had said, is it, too, it, it is too small a thing for God to restore Israel. You are to be a light to the Gentiles. And God was thinking of the international scene. To this day, you know, Mr. Begin, I fear, sees only the national scene in Israel. That's all his concern is. And he just doesn't realize that God's concern is to establish his rule for the nations. So even modern Israel still doesn't see the kingdom. Some Jews do, and some Israelis do. Increasing number of Israelis do. There are 35 indigenous fellowships of Israeli believers in Jesus now. In Israel. It may not sound much to you. It's a miracle. Instead of all these dreadful denominational buildings going up in Jerusalem, everybody importing their own traditions into that place, there are 35 indigenous Israeli fellowships who believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. They're in Israel. God has kept that remnant. And we Gentiles must never forget that the kingdom is Jewish. Salvation is for the Jews. And so the Old Testament closes with tremendous hope, waiting for a king to come who would establish the kingdom. Now, those who hoped for the king were divided clearly into two groups. And Jesus had problems with this when he came. One group could only see the national kingdom, but the other group could see the international. Some could only see the restoration of a Davidic kingdom, but others were longing for the kingdom of God. When God would reign on the earth, they were longing for the day when the, the, the house of the Lord would be established in the mountain of the Lord and the nations would dissolve and learn war no more. And just up the road from our home is Greenham Common, where those poor women who are very vulnerable to Satan are crying out in panic for disarmament. But disarmament won't come until the kingdom of God comes. And under his rule of righteousness, the nations will be able to disarm. International disputes will be settled by the king. So there was the Jewish hope for a simple national restoration, the hope that said, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But there was also the international hope that said, I'm looking for the kingdom of God on earth. And the rabbis who looked for the kingdom used to say, a prayer is not a prayer that does not ask for the kingdom. That's quite a statement. There are rabbis in Jerusalem today who would say, your prayer is not a prayer if you did not include within it a prayer, your kingdom come. And Jesus said, you pray every day, your kingdom come. Tomorrow we're going to see the exciting news that when Jesus was born, the kingdom had come. Father, we want to thank you for the, for the people of Israel. Lord, we thank you for that in our staff prayer meeting earlier this morning, but I just want to pray again and say thank you for the Jews. Thank you for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Thank you for Elijah. Thank you for the unnamed 7,000 who were your subjects even then. Thank you that you've kept a remnant of Jews even to this day who are true subjects of the King. And Lord, again, thank you for Joseph and Mary for their looking after our Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, the Jew, our Messiah, and theirs. And Lord, thank you that we may learn from their history. And oh God, I pray that you'll have mercy on the church. Lord, you have every right to cut so much of the church right out today because we're living in two worlds. We go to church on Sunday and on Monday to Sunday we behave like everybody else. We just live for the things everybody else lives for. Oh God, forgive your people for halting with two opinions, for wanting to live in the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of Satan at the same time. Oh God, show us wherein we do this. And will you call out for yourself here in Scotland a remnant of true subjects of the kingdom and cause them to live under the king so that people are amazed at how they can live in such unity and harmony together, in such blessing, in such peace, in such prosperity. 
Lord, they can't understand it because they can't see the invisible king of heaven. But Lord, may they see his kingdom, a visible model and expression of heaven on earth. Father, it's a sobering thought to us that people should be able to come into our fellowship and say, if this is what heaven is like, I want to go there. But I pray that you'll raise up fellowships that are heaven on earth, expressions of your kingdom, colonies of heaven. The new Israel, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people on earth living under your reign and rule. Oh God, do it for your name's sake. Amen.